Hello everyone and welcome to the USS Midway Museum. I'm Dave Kuntz, the museum's marketing director. We're delighted to once again bring you another installment of our Destination Midway video series today with our ship historian Carl Zingheim. As we are conducting this webcast midday in California, we'd like to refer to this as our Lunchbox webcast. You know, 75 years ago in 1945, a new and highly advanced aircraft carrier entered the U.S. Naval Fleet. It was the USS Midway. The Midway was a tremendous departure from the previous naval aircraft carrier designs. And today, Carl will discuss the various factors that ultimately influence the design and the construction of the USS Midway. I'd now like to introduce our ship historian, Carl Zingheim. Carl. Thank you, Dave. I'm Carl Zingheim, the staff historian for the USS Midway Museum, and in today's episode, I'm speaking to you from our hangar deck, standing in front of one of our most interesting artifacts, a conceptual model of what would turn out to be a major departure in American carrier design, the armored deck battle-worthy aircraft carrier. When the USS Midway joined the fleet right after World War II in 1945, she did in fact represent a number of major breakthroughs in American carrier concept and design. This included, of course, having an armored deck as well as extensive subdivisions and other types of armored provisions. However, in order to understand why Midway was such a departure from American carrier design, we actually have to turn the clock even farther back to the end of World War I. Shortly after that conflict, the major navies of the world uh, had a conference in Washington to discuss the world's first set of international arms limitations treaties, in effect trying to find a way to limit the size and the spending rates that was going on amongst the three surviving major navies in the world. This included not only the United States Navy, but also Britain's Royal Navy and the Imperial Japanese Navy. One of the things that was considered as part of the naval uh, limitations process was coming up with artificial restrictions on the numbers and size of each type of major warship, and that included battleships, of course, but also this newfangled thing that had just been invented at the end of World War I, the aircraft carrier. Basically, to in order to how much tonnage and what kind of size you could put into uh, certain ship types like aircraft carriers, that meant you had to make certain design sacrifices in order to emphasize things that your particular doctrine would uh, favor. In the case of the United States, that basically meant building aircraft carriers throughout the 1920s and into the 1930s that had deliberate design flaws included in them, such as poor protection for machinery spaces and other vital spots in order to emphasize other aspects of carrier operations that we'll get into in a minute. Basically what this meant was is that the United States started the Second World War, particularly in the Pacific, with ship designs that were actually quite compromised for what they were attempting to do. This included, of course, the famed Yorktown class that saw extensive combat throughout World War II, and believe it or not, even the war-built Essex class, of which 24 examples were eventually commissioned, even though they arose after the collapse of the treaty system, they still had to incorporate a lot of design deficiencies because there just wasn't time to start from scratch to get the American carrier fleet up to the size it needed. What this really meant in practice then in this pre-war period that we're talking about is the fact that both the American and the Japanese carrier navies went along parallel tracks. Essentially what it meant was they were emphasizing large air groups to put the maximum number of aircraft into the air as possible, and that meant sacrificing things like protection or subdivision of machinery spaces. And of course, it also meant that you had to have certain infamous design factors like a wooden flight deck. So both American and Japanese aircraft carriers featured rather lightweight wood top flight decks that uh, enabled concentration and tonnage to be placed elsewhere and to build very large ships that could accommodate upwards of 80 to 100 combat aircraft apiece. The British with the Royal Navy, however, had to go in an entirely different direction. The major reason for this was that right after World War I, the Royal Air Force managed to monopolize all military aviation in Britain, and this included what they called the fleet air arm. And so throughout the 1920s and right up until 1938, practically at the 11th hour before war broke out in Europe, the Royal Air Force owned the aircraft and the Royal Navy owned the ships. And so you had this very bizarre separation in responsibilities. 
And when you consider that the Royal Air Force had all the budgets for all military aviation, other types of military flying, such as bombers and later fighters, took precedence. Guess where naval aviation came out in the table of priorities for the British? In fact, that was one reason why the British started World War II still flying fabric biplanes off their flight decks. So what that meant for Royal Navy designers was that they had to build carriers that had to have passive defenses and be able to withstand blows that, the, that enemies, particularly operating in Europe, who could uh, field large land-based air forces both in the Mediterranean and in the North Atlantic, would have to bring to bear against their carriers. This meant an entirely different design philosophy. This philosophy, for instance, came to fruition in the late 1930s with the decision to build not only steel deck, flight deck aircraft carriers, but also to include armor protection, both at the flight deck level and in varying, varying degrees on the hangar deck and below. And so the first armored deck as designed carrier to really take to the seas was HMS Illustrious, seen here, who was completed just before the outbreak of the Second World War. And this, of course, would be a major influence in the intentions the Americans were going when it came up to design their first post-treaty carrier. But with that, let's hand it back to Dave for some special announcements. Thank you, Carl. I uh, just wanted to remind everybody that you're watching Destination Midway with our ship historian, Carl Zingheim. And we want to make this an interactive webcast, so please submit your questions in the comments section and we'll do a question and answer session following the presentation. And also, if you're interested in making a donation to the Midway, which is a nonprofit museum, you can do so at our website at midway.org. And we'd like to thank everybody who's already made a donation uh, to the Midway, and we appreciate that very much. So now I'd like to turn it back over to Carl to finish his, pre his presentation. Thank you, Dave. Picking up where we left off, the HMS Illustrious design uh, offered some trade-offs as well. For instance, when you have armor, you've got a lot of weight, and unfortunately for aircraft carriers, that means the weight is going to be rather high off the waterline to sustain a flight deck. And they had uh, certain artificial uh, tonnage restrictions that they were also dealing with at the time, so consequently, that meant although these aircraft carriers were rather well protected, certainly by American or Japanese standards, they had to sacrifice one critical component in order to get all that extra weight to fit on a similar sized hull and that was the size of the air group and so British aircraft carriers tended to go to sea with half or perhaps even fewer the complement of what their contemporaries in the American Japanese navies had. This of course would not do for American carrier doctrine. However, other advantages to the British armored deck design really came to fruition. For example, in January 1941 even before, a year before Pearl Harbor practically, the Illustrious was engaged in combat operations against the Germans in the Mediterranean and in January 41, she received a very severe dive bombing attack from German Stukas off Malta in the central Mediterranean. In fact, she sustained so many thousand ba pound bomb high explosive uh, and armor piercing hits that any other contemporary aircraft carrier without this armor protection would probably have succumbed directly. These are actual images taken aboard the Illustrious during that devastating dive bombing attack. Furthermore, after she survived that attack, she put into Malta to undergo emergency repairs and she was attacked again while she was still pierside. So she sustained additional damage. Eventually, it turned out that the, the damage that was inflicted upon the illustrious in, the, in these devastating two attacks was too much for British shipyards to be able to handle under the pressures of war. But thankfully, the United States was getting closer and closer to participating in World War II and to help out Britain, and so the illustrious was able to go all the way around the continent of Africa, across the Atlantic, and be able to put into Norfolk, Virginia to undergo her repairs. This is an image that was taken at the latter state of her complete reconstruction, but what's really interesting about this sojourn that she had in a supposedly neutral American yard was the fact that our naval architects now had an opportunity to be able to go anywhere they needed to see how an armored deck would actually perform against contemporary World War II ordnance. And so it was through a very thoroughgoing analysis of the British design philosophy, how they employed their armor, where it worked, where things didn't work, that really started to make critical contributions at a time when the Midway design, although she wasn't even called Midway at that point, was really starting to come to fruition.
Here are some other close-ups that just show you just what kind of damage was inflicted by those German bombs. You had the uh, armor that was on the flight deck was punctured, but at least it didn't devastate the rest of the area. And you also had a lighter metal uh, uh, flight deck elevator here that uh, su suffered severe buckling from blasts that occurred underneath. One factor that the American architects noticed uh, from the British design was not only was she armored, but they tended to have enclosed hangars with armored boxes and sides. And essentially what that meant was if there was an explosion, and there were on the illustrious, the explosion had nowhere else to vent but straight up, and so weak points like an aircraft elevator would become devastated. This certainly was demonstrated as well rather dramatically at the Battle of Midway because although the Japanese did not have armored deck carriers of their own at the Battle of Midway in June 1942, they did uh, follow the uh, closed in hangar deck uh, design and as a result of the devastating explosions from American bombs that had landed uh, through their flight decks into their hangar decks, entire portions of the flight deck erupted. What we have here is a photograph off to the left showing the Japanese carrier Hiryu the day after uh, the June June 4th uh, contest between the carriers, and if you take a very close look at what this image is showing, she's lacking her flight deck from about where the, uh, the island is all the way forward. That is cavernous. That's all blown out. So that shows you one of the disadvantages then of being able to have everything concentrated in an armored box hangar deck. That doesn't mean, though, that the American design philosophy didn't have its own flaws. In the same battle, in the adjoining uh, photograph we have in this plate, we have the listing USS Yorktown, a member of the Yorktown class, who had received devastating torpedo hits that promptly knocked out her propulsion plant. So the rather limited protection and the fact that most of the machinery tended to be concentrated in very few spaces meant that it didn't take a lot of damage uh, below the waterline to be able to disable these earlier carrier designs. But all this, all this was factored in into how the Midway herself was going to be built. What's remarkable about this new, uh, completely different carrier design is that despite all the demands for building existing types and all the other demands for special metals and other programs that were going on, construction of the all new Midway went at a breathtaking pace. She was laid down in the summer of 1943 and here we have imagery from the early part of 1945 and she's already gotten up uh, past uh, the second deck and in fact she was commissioned just a few months after these images were taken at Norfolk. In the meantime, the war in the Pacific was proceeding apace and we were getting additional reminders of why having an armored flight deck was advisable. The Japanese had by this time shifted over to suicide attacks with their aircraft, the infamous Kamikaze Corps, and we have some imagery here of what happens when these wooden flight decks encountered the Kamikazes crashing into uh, the wood and then detonating inside the ships. Essentially what you wind up having is extensive damage done to the wooden flight decks as well as any aircraft that may be part Park topside, such as this image here of the carrier Bunker Hill, which suffered a particularly devastating kamikaze attack in May 1945. Even more devastating as well was a, a conventional bomb hit that occurred on the Franklin uh, in March of 1945 off Japan. She had her entire hangar deck and much of her flight deck covered with fueled and armed aircraft when these bombs punched through these unprotected flight decks and detonated on the hangar deck. In fact, most of the damage that you see here on the image to the right or the left where she finally made it back to New York for repairs was actually from her own ordnance on her own aircraft exploding all over the place, including rockets that were shooting back and forth. So the entire flight deck was so devastated that we see here with the adjoining image to the right, the Navy was forced to basically cut away the hangar deck sides, remove the entire flight deck, and start all over again at the hangar deck level. And you could see they actually had to bring in some two by fours to provide additional shoring for the now unsupported island superstructure as they began this complete rebuild. So these were definite underscoring reminders for American designers of what the pitfalls were for having unprotected flight decks. In the meantime, the British carriers had joined the Americans in the final drive on Japan, and they too were subjected to kamikaze attacks. But by virtue of having their armored protected steel flight decks, the damage, as you can see here, although appears devastating topside, 
never really caused any problems on the, on the interiors of the ships. And so the British carriers were able to take care of matters topside without uh, huge holes or devastating fires below and able to get on with their mission hours after being hit. And so if any reminder needed to be made about the efficacy of having protected flight decks at this time, this was definitely it. And so after World War II, the Midway finally gets commissioned sporting her armored flight deck and her protected uh, hangar decks and sides. And as you can see here with uh, some of this imagery, you can see that the deck looks completely different from what you saw earlier. This is not a wooden deck. Those are non-skid uh, non strips. They've got applied across the armor here. And it also had some other advantages such as being able to withstand devastating crashes such as the famous crash of Commander Duncan and his uh, F-9F Panther jet that struck the ramp, spreading burning fuel over half the flight deck, as well as other peculiar demonstrations such as having the ability to take a captured German V-2 ballistic missile and launch from the flight deck without burning up all the, uh, the wooden timbers below. So being able to have an armored flight deck because of the collapse of the international treaty system and having the ability to afford that extra tonnage really paid off for the Navy. And with that, we'll hand it back to Dave. Thank you very much, Carl, for that insightful presentation on the design and the construction of the USS Midway. I'd also like to thank all our viewers for submitting questions, and we have several minutes for a question and answer period from Carl. But before we get to the first question, I just want to let everybody know that we had a thumbs up from a viewer in Sweden, so it's nice to know that we have viewers of Carl's uh, webcast from all over the world. So our first question actually comes from Tim, and this dates back even before the start of the war, and he wanted to know, why did the leading maritime nations agree to limit their navies after World War I? That's a good question, Tim. Basically, the rationale for having a naval arms limitation treaty right after the First World War was the fact that, frankly, few people could afford another arms race. One of the contributing factors to the start of the First World War was a naval arms race between Germany and Great Britain. And guess what? Warships are extremely expensive to build and to operate after they're completed. It turns out that the British had basically put themselves in debt just to fight the First World War, and they had already disposed of one opponent when all of a sudden their rivals across the Atlantic, the Americans and the Japanese, were starting to threaten to outbuild even what they had at the time. So they were kind of uh, hurting in terms of funding for producing a new naval arms race. And then, as it turns out, the Japanese had to admit they really didn't have the finances for it either. They would have loved to have had a much larger modernized fleet, but financial realities were really starting to weigh in on their planners and they reluctantly agreed this was a good idea and at least as far as the americans were concerned although we could afford such a fleet there just wasn't any sentiment at the beginning of the 1920s to be able to lavish that kind of money on military spending at a time when the war to end all wars supposedly had just been concluded great carl here's a question from john um, and he wanted to know why especially by the americans were large air groups favored uh, as part of naval doctrine? Basically, what had happened with carrier aviation is it very rapidly went from being able to protect your own spotter planes for the battleships and interfering with the other guys' spotter planes to eventually aircraft could carry their own ship-threatening ordnance themselves. And certainly, by the 1930s, carrier aviation had become a prestige arm of the fleet with aircraft that were quite capable of causing great harm to opposing battleships. And so what that meant was you needed mass. It was in, there was in, very much an incentive to be able to have as many aircraft in the air as possible to go out, find the enemy fleet, and be able to target their ships successfully. So having offensive-minded fleets, both with the, the Americans and, as it turns out, with Japanese doctrine, was very much at the forefront of trans-Pacific strategy. Excellent. Uh, we have another question here from Bob, and he wanted to know how could construction of the mid Midway, especially in the middle of the war, move along so quickly? That's really a fascinating question in just how effective the American home front was in sustaining World War II. Historians love to dwell, of course, on the fighting fronts and all that, but what really made it all happen and so breathtakingly successful in a short period of time was the fact that the entirety of the American public was mobilized for this conflict and was really ready, willing, and able to be able to take American industry and expand it to the point where not only could it provide the quantity 
expertise that were needed in all the services to fight globally, but also to get these uh, weapons turned out in a surprisingly short amount of time. What happens, of course, with the Midway design is that she's a capital ship of a completely different design. So Norfolk Navy Yard had the luxury of taking their artisans, their experienced people working with this new technology of welding, and be able to employ them effectively to take even a new design like the Midway class and get them turned out in a remarkably short space of time. This meant that they had a surfeit of wartime labor that came in that were put on other projects, such as merchant ship or escort carriers to be able to keep up with shipping demands and they could take the cream of their own shipbuilding skills and be able to focus them on producing an entirely new capital ship. Yeah, very, very interesting. Uh, here's a question from Carol and she was curious um, because you know the United States Navy had an opportunity to learn so much from the repairs of the illustrious, uh, why didn't they just use the illustrious uh, for the design of the Midway? Well, that's, uh, that's a really good question because why not? You've got this uh, remarkable example of a ship that had just received a severe pounding from the enemy using the very best weapons that he had at his disposal and the ship still survived, but there were decided disadvantages in the British approach. Furthermore, one carryover from American design was they wanted to be able to get as many aircraft up onto the flight deck ready to roll off and launch the strike as possible. That meant taking the time to get these delicate uh, piston engine aircraft warmed up properly and that occurred on the hangar decks. That's why most American carrier designs before the war had open-sided hangar decks so you could turn over the engines and have enough ventilation so you won't choke everyone else out while the aircraft were getting warmed up beforehand on the hangar deck. So when they went up and were spotted in the pack on the flight deck, they were ready to go. Well, that was something the Americans insisted on carrying through, even with the Midway design. And in her original straight deck configuration, she pretty much accorded to that, although the open sides were rather abbreviated because of the existence of a very heavy five-inch gun battery, which this model faithfully reproduces. That's tremendously interesting. We've got a question here from Joseph. He was curious, were there any special features that were used in the design and construction of the Midway incorporated into future carriers? It turns out that uh, they went a little too far in trying to build a battle-worthy carrier. In fact, her original designation was CVB, as in a large carrier, as opposed to the CVs that were the other conventional fleet carriers. These included, in addition to having extensive sub-compartmentalization, this ship has more compartments uh, divided up than any other ship type that had been built. Each engine has its own Spe uh, special protected space. All 12 boilers each have their own room. In fact, the ship is very much like an ice cube tray below the second deck. You, there's no uh, lateral communication. If you want to go to the adjoining compartment, you've got to first go up, over, and then back down again. So the subdivision was a little too extensive. There was also uh, quadruple uh, spacing on uh, side blisters and bottom protection, and she originally had some armor belts also applied onto the sides. But perhaps the biggest complaint that the Navy had was that this sub-compartmentalization even applied to birthing compartments and the bridge structure. So the Midways quickly got a reputation, even in the undemanding standards of 1945, for being cramped and rather uncomfortable ships. In fact, it was so bad on the bridge that as soon as the Navy was able to get her back into the yards in 1947, they actually chopped off the forward half of the original island and craned it off. And so what we have from the beginning of the forepart of the funnel all the way to the end is the second island the USS Midway has because the first one was so narrowly designed and had an armored uh, co uh, column tube and you couldn't get around on the bridge, they overdid it. And so the Navy did its best to be able to compensate for that. And by the way, they never repeated that kind of chopping up of uh, spaces in any subsequent carrier design. Mm -hmm. yeah, very interesting. Another question sort of related back to uh, the, the special features. What challenges did the design encounter consider armored decking uh, being that it was much heavier than a wooden deck, and w what kind of challenges did the, did the carrier face with that? This is a good time to introduce some exclusive footage uh, that we took of uh, certain parts of the ship that you can actually still see elements of the World War II design. One thing that makes armor different from ordinary construction steel is that it's really an alloy of other exotic metals like nickel that tends to make the metal a lot harder and more resistant to being punched through. 
that tends to mean that it gets to be heavier for a given amount of size compared to structural steel. Problems with ships is about, it all comes down to stability. So the trouble with an aircraft carrier is you've got heavy weight and the higher you put a weight up on a ship, the more effective it is in reducing your stability. And so um, the aircraft carrier really had a problem that battleships even didn't have to face with their lower centers of gravity is the fact that you have to have the flight deck up at a certain height to operate your aircraft and still have useful hangar deck space below. So the Navy really had to walk the tightrope in figuring out what's the maximum amount of armor thickness that we could get away with on a sizable ship like this, considering that we're 50 feet above the water line and where could we trim elsewhere? So they arrived at a three and a half inch uh, compromise on armor, which is rather modest armor uh, by naval standards at the flight deck level, and then repeated it with decreasing thicknesses of armor for the second deck and third deck and so on. And so what we have with uh, some of our exclusive footage here is you can actually see where they have, we have an armored uh, hatch, for instance, that's still a part of the original hangar deck. And as you can see, it's got counterweights and it's definitely something you don't want to have fall on your head, but it's very indicative of the kind of thinking they had in World War II to make this carrier battle-proof. Another instance we have as well is that uh, they also thought to really ch uh, subdivide the hangar deck, and perhaps that is uh, a carryover from their experience in looking at the illustrious and her damage, is that the original midway hangar had other hangar deck doors that could chop this uh, entire hangar deck into four smaller hangar bays. Uh, we have some footage as well of where the these doors used to be for the, the after part, so the only surviving doors are the ones that are amidships, but in the original uh, super battle-ready uh, carrier of 1945, she had two additional sets. So you can probably imagine then that there were considerable challenges in both designing the ship and then living aboard her in those early years. Mm, that's incredible. Uh, question from Carla, um, kind of moving forward a little bit uh, after World War II when the Midway went through its first overhaul. Um, it was designed as a straight deck, and she was curious why did they determine that they would go and try and put an angle deck on the uh, midway as opposed to just decommissioning it at the time? Well, the Navy had quite an investment in uh, the three Midway class carriers, and apparently, if you judge by the lengths of their respective careers, the Navy was really determined to get the most out of their initial World War II investment. That included being able to take the, the three ships and upgrade them as necessary as aviation technology advanced. One of the problems they ran into with in introducing jet aircraft into the straight deck era for carriers was the fact that it was a very dangerous way to operate aircraft. Jets have much uh, quicker reaction times on when things happen. There's a little bit of a lag time, by the way, with early jet engines when you make a throttle adjustment. And things just happen faster overall with jets, which caused uh, a lot of deck accidents. Another problem, of course, too, with the American way of doing things is that We've got all the aircraft up, so we land them all aboard and we park them all the way forward while we're trapping. That means if you don't catch your hook, you're going to have to catch a barrier because guess what's in front of you? A whole bunch of aircraft parked. So it really turned out to be quite a problem getting jet aircraft aboard without having accidents. The British were having the same problem, but they came up with a series of breakthroughs, among them adding an angle to the flight deck so you have a clear diagonal runway that's free from any parked aircraft that would be more forward on the rest of the flight deck, and it turned out to suit uh, jet aircraft just fine. So Midway was brought into the yards to be able to take advantage of that design breakthrough. Yeah, I think you may have already answered it, but Julian was curious, where did the idea of an angled deck design come from? Basically, it came down to the fact that uh, the British were desperate to try and keep uh, aviation going in their post-war fleet and having the same problems we were experiencing with uh, jet aircraft, they had a, a more, more keen interest in being able to really make this work because if they can't make jet aircraft work, it's very hard to sell the idea of having these expensive ships to a, a doubting Ministry of Defense. So they came through with a triple breakthrough on safely operating jet aircraft that 
that the Americans later uh, perfected and adopted. Among them, of course, was the angle deck I just described, the optical landing system. So instead of having to rely on somebody with a set of paddles uh, giving body postures to uh, advise you on how to uh, make your approach, you can now use uh, a light signal that's traveling much faster for you to make adjustments in a timely manner. And the steam catapult, which would uh, enable a lot of power to get these heavy jet aircraft up to flying speed without having all the dangerous components of a lot of hydraulic oil. So it was really a compulsion on the part of the British to preserve fleet aviation at a time when the jets were really starting to be a challenge for operating them effectively at sea. And as it turns out, it was of immense benefit for the American Navy as well. Great. Here's a question from Amanda. Uh, she was curious that uh, as technology evolved over the years, how did the defensive weaponry uh, for the Midway evolve with those advances in technology? Well, what's really interesting about the early design of the Midway is that she was uh, one of the few actual survivors of this super fleet that the Navy was looking forward to producing now that the restrictions of international treaties were shorn. And by the way, with war, you now had sky high budgets. And so they really wanted to build the primo designs for each class of warship. What survived of those dreams of having these super ships in the carrier category, and we see this with the model here, was a series of the new 5-inch 54 caliber long barrel dual purpose 5-inch gun. And so it was a lot of emphasis put on that. In fact, the unbuilt super battleship Montana was supposed to have a twin mount version of that. And so the emphasis then was on being able to have longer range defensive firepower that could take care of an incoming threat like a kamikaze long before it would get into its lethal dive range. And so having a longer reach on your defenses turned out to be of a prime uh, concern for the Midway's original designers, as well as having more extensive automatic anti-aircraft defenses usually located at the hangar deck level. You could still see remnants of all this thinking with the weld beads of where these mounts originally were. One trouble was, however, as the ship was continuously modified over the years, something had to go. The ship was taking on weight. Stability is still a problem. And so one of the things they had to do is bit by bit, they started to take off the five inch uh, 54 mounts until eventually the Midway uh, ended her career with no gun mounts on at all. And, and, and that was a follow on question from Amanda. She was curious at the end of the Midway's career, what happened to the armor and the weaponry that was on the ship? Well, a lot of it was taken off uh, by hook and by crook. For example, you had the armored conning tower that interfered with bridge operations. That went with the rest of the original bridge in 1947. The side belts were also taken off both as a means of compensation for additional improvements that the ship was making and also as a concession to the fact that modern post-World War II anti-ship weaponry would have rendered such uh, defenses useless. So as it turns out, when they started to expand the size of the flight deck to accommodate first one type of angle and then a more radical angled deck, things like that had to go by the boards. In fact, the weight savings got to the point where if you go up to our bridge, they actually removed the portholes inside the original pilot house in an effort to save weight. So everything you put onto the ship, you're going to have to find something else to take off in order to maintain that range of stability. And we have uh, one final question from Stuart. And he wants to know, uh, when was the Midway decommissioned and how long did it take uh, until it became a museum here in San Diego? Well, uh, Midway had a long career, 47 years as a deploying carrier and wasn't decommissioned until April of 1992, right across the way here at Naval Air Station North Island. She had no future in the fleet. Uh, unlike uh, the larger deck carriers that were decommissioned, there is a congressional mandate to be able to keep them in a reserve condition in case of national emergency. Midway clearly uh, it was past her prime at that point. So after decommissioning, she was supposed to go rather promptly into the breakers yards. In fact, one of the outcomes of that original decision was that when we eventually did get the Midway for conversion into a museum, we found they really had cut her to the bone when it came to removing useful equipment because as far as they were concerned, she didn't have a future. So she actually sat awaiting orders to go to the breakers yards uh, in the mid 90s when finally this organization in San Diego was starting to get traction about uh, acquiring a retired aircraft carrier for a museum 
Midway certainly fit the bill. So it was kind of like a stay of execution, if you will, for the Midway that the organization down in San Diego proved to be so successful so early. And eventually, of course, we obtained the Midway in 2003, and after some sprucing up, she arrived in San Diego at the beginning of 2004 and opened six months later as a first-rate museum. Well, I think it's just tremendously amazing that uh, this carrier started her career 75 years ago this year um, and has served the nation well for 47 years and continues to serve the nation as the, uh, the most popular and most highly visited aircraft carrier museum in the country. So uh, this concludes our presentation today. I again would like to thank you, Carl, for, for the presentation. And I'd like to thank all our viewers for tuning in and submitting their questions. And I also encourage everyone to continue to follow Carl on our Midway website where you can find all his fascinating blogs. Our next Destination Midway will be a special webcast on, web on Veterans Day, November 11th. So continue to follow us on social media for all the details because you truly do not want to miss that presentation. And thanks to everyone who's made a donation. We greatly appreciate your generosity. So we'll see you next time on Veterans Day for our special edition of Destination Midway.